So good morning. Good morning and welcome to the second day of the Big Sick 20. Guys, can I ask you to take your seats? So we're going to get started with the lectures in a couple of minutes. So I hope you all had a good day yesterday, whether you were skiing or ultrasound workshopping. The workshops yesterday evening were absolutely fantastic. I took home a number of good learning points. One, I will say to my French colleagues, is I prefer to use the ultrasound, not the cut down, but also some really nice little tips and tricks on the airway and some really nice stuff uh, from the David Knott Foundation on uh, mass casualty triage. It was really, really interesting and a fun workshop evening. Though tonight is going to be the fondue night, which for me is always the highlight of this, uh, this conference. And that, that got me thinking, actually, because I, I realized that in the 48 hours I've been in Zermatt, I have had one vegetable, and that was a tomato with encased in cheese with bread. And, um, and that is probably a good thing, because this morning we're talking about circulation and cardiac arrest. And... Um, and I, I, I think the first speaker is going to be talking about the stuff that I might need later if I eat more cheese, and probably later tonight with cheese and beer, um, is, is citizen response to cardiac arrest. And then we're going to go on talking about how technology comes into cardiac arrest and then some of the really funky uh, interventions that we have, some that you might have seen yesterday. So first, this morning, I'm going to try and say this name correctly because uh, I'm being British, I can't speak any other languages properly. It's um, Hans van Skruppen. 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 Almost good. Hans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's an anaesthetist. He works in Amsterdam and he's done his PhD, well, he's doing his PhD looking at cardiac arrest and ventilation management in cardiac arrest. And he's got an interest in obviously the clinical side, but the educational and the research side of this. And as I said, uh, this morning he's going to speak to us about the citizen response. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. It's a big sick, it's the sickest patients first hours. I want to talk to you about the sickest patient of all, the patient in cardiac arrest, and also not the first hours, but the first minutes. Because in the first minutes when cardiac arrest occurs in the out-of-hospital setting, we're not there. It's the citizens, the laypersons, family and bystanders who can make the difference. That's what I want to talk to you about. So I practice in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam is actually very well known for research station in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So in like three to 200 years ago, uh, there was very often cardiac arrest, but it was due to drowning. It was not through uh, cardiac causes. When people had their long work day, they went into the cafes and had a couple of beers, just like we did yesterday evening. And um, then they went to for a walk home and then they need to pee. So they went to pee into all these waters, and being drunk as they were, fell into the water. So there was a lot of drowning in Amsterdam because there was a lot of drinking in Amsterdam as well. That's now, you can understand that there were fences alongside the borders of the bridges that has a historical reason. So, but because there was so often an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, people felt that they need to do something. And it was the laypersons, it was the citizens actually who came into action. And they founded this uh, citizen response association, the Association for the Rescue of Drowned Victims, and promoting the rescue of these victims, creating training programs to enable people to get out of the water and being successfully resuscitated. So this association still exists today. It's more than 250 years old and it still exists today. And you still get the same medal that they gave back in the days when you resuscitated the victim. So in this medal, which I like very, mu very much, you can see a couple of things. First of all, you notice that the CPR techniques have been evolved, uh, evolved uh, since then. But there are two things that I really, really like. So first of all, what I really like is the symbol, the symbol of um, backing off death by resuscitation. And I think that's what all motivates us, right? That's what we're here for. And actually the text on top uh, actually states that uh, rescuing this victim will enable them to go back to their 
country and to their loved ones. And that's actually what we're here for today. So this is the first thing I like very much. The second thing what I like very much, if you can see here at the bottom end, you can see a bellow. And the bellow was used to blow up hot smoke into the rectum of the victim in order to revive them. Okay, so this is the part where I'm really, really happy that guidelines change. You can also see a bottle there which is filled with alcohol and I'm still not sure whether the alcohol is for the victim or for the rescuer. But anyway, this drowning is not the thing that we faced uh, most of the times uh, when we talk about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I want to talk to you about Luke. Luke is uh, a middle-aged man who collapsed on the floor in the living room. And he was witnessed uh, with his wife being uh, unwell, collapsed to the floor, and not responding anymore. And I want you to take a minute to imagine Luke living a couple of streets down the place where you live. So in your hometown, a couple of blocks away, Luke is living, he collapsed, and he's not responding anymore. So what happens in the very first minutes? And we all know that the actions in the first minutes are essential. Because his wife, who was uh, uh, panicking and, and reaching out for the phone, uh, she needs to recognize that there's something wrong. She needs to pick up the phone and, and call the dispatch center. Basic life support needs to get started. And defibrillation needs to take place very soon. We know this. And as much as anesthesiologists, intensivists, you know, all of your clinical backgrounds, uh, as, as much as we love putting down tube stuff, you know, but it, it, it's, it's these basics which are life-saving. So most often there is a shockable rhythm due to a cardiac cause, at least in a, uh, a large part of the cases. And we all know that ventricular fibrillation actually has a very good prognosis. Uh, I bet you all have had patients in your hospital at the cath lab or in the emergency department. You see them go into VF and you shock them out, right? But that's because you're there with a defibrillator. But no one's there with a defibrillator at Luke's house. So we need to get the defibrillator there. So that means that ventricular fibrillation and successful defibrillation is not really only a medical thing. It's a logistical thing. Because we need to get this done within six minutes to achieve the highest success rates. And six minutes, it's quick. It's a short amount of time. But it is able to, you are able to do so. It is achievable if we take effort. And of course, I'm not sure, uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, people working here pre-hospitally. So if you, if you hear this talk, you can, you can think, uh, now I've got the argument for my, you know, director to buy the fastest car available, the Lotus Evora, with a top speed of like 20, uh, 260 uh, kilometers per hour, uh, going from uh, zero to 100 kilometers per hour in, in just in five seconds. Um, and as much I would love to have an observer shift with these guys, uh, which is in Dubai, you're not going to reach 100 kilometers per hour in the city center of Amsterdam. It won't take you five seconds. It will take you five days to reach that speed. So it doesn't matter how fast your car is. You will never be able to beat the neighbors. The neighbors will be there as quick as they can, and they will always be faster than you. So we need to think about mobilizing the neighbors, the fellow citizens in the street, to go there and start basic life support and give defibrillations. And in the Netherlands, we are currently working for a couple of years to achieve this goal, and uh, we're heading that way. It's not 100% yet. We have still have work to do. But before EMS arrives, so before the ambulance gets there, BLS is started in 84% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and the AAD is placed in 65%. So an average response time of ambulance service is nine and a half minutes, which is quite comparable with other uh, European countries. And I think this is one of the main reasons that if you compare countries, and you can do that with the Utstein Comparator Group, which is the witnessed VF patient we, we talked about, like Luke. In the Netherlands, we're currently around 55 to 60% survival in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And other countries who 
really have focused on this, like Denmark and other Scandinavian countries as well, you can see equal outcomes if you invest in this phase. So I think it's good for us to just take a moment to think about citizen response and how uh, uh, it is built up and what you can do as a critical care physician or emergency provider, uh, like a research stationist, uh, to make a positive impact on this process. So there are actually three ingredients of citizen response. First of all, you need a good activation system, which can be operated by the uh, dispatch center. Second of all, you need trained citizen responders who are also with the system. And you need 24-7 available AEDs. Well, in the Netherlands, we got Hartslag Nu, which is translated Heartbeat Now, which is a nationwide system which uses both text messaging and also the app with uh, with the GPS uh, location as well. And it will alert uh, in case of cardiac arrest to uh, get citizens to the scene either to go directly to the address and start basic life support or to get the near AED first and then to go to the address. Well, I'll just briefly mention this because uh, Lina Lamo will uh, go into this in further detail. So how about training? I think it's very important for laypersons to have a very simple, uniform training. And uh, in the Netherlands, the, the training program and all the course materials are developed by the Dutch Research Station Council. And uh, there are a couple of things that I think that were very helpful in achieving those high success rates. First of all, we teach persons not only to provide basic life support, but also to recognize the cardiac arrest. And this is actually most often underestimated how important it is. So. We made a video with an actor uh, who shows what it looks like to gasp. So we teach people that there are snoring sounds. People can look like they're breathing, but it's not normal. So. Uh, that's not a normal situation. This is actually, in fact, a cardiac arrest, and they need to uh, alert and start basic life support. So uh, make sure that in the training programs, if you're training laypersons, make sure that not only to focus on the technical stuff, but also in the recognition of cardiac arrest, which is equally important. And of course, people need to become competent. They, they need to learn how to perform uh, chest compressions. And I think in the uh, more current uh, cur uh, course that there has been less emphasis on PowerPoint slides and more emphasis on getting on the chest. Uh, that's where you learn. I think that's very important. Another thing which is important for laypersons is not only to make them competent, but also make them confident. Because if they are competent, but they're not confident, there's less likely that they will actually take action. So they need to become confident in the fact that they can really make a difference. And um, we're currently in the Netherlands looking into uh, optimizing the training as well. So uh, the current status is that the initial basic life support provider course is a four-hour course. And after uh, two years, you do a recertification course. And uh, the two main disadvantages is, uh, first of all, a four-hour course. You can't run a four-hour course in the evening. It's too long. And second of all, uh, after two years, that's, that's a long period of time. We know from the educational literature that, that your skills will decrease in a couple of months already. So two years is too long. So currently, within the Dutch Research Station Council, we're looking into a way of like optimizing this. And this is the concept that we have until now that we're looking into. We want to decrease the amount of time for the provider course, the initial provider course, so then people can actually take this in an evening and uh, don't refresh in two, two years, but after one year. So make it more frequent. But of course, you have to lay lower the threshold to actually go through the, uh, to the refresher course. Because if the refresher course also takes four hours, then you're quite reluctant to go to the refresher, right? But if it only takes one hour, if you just need one hour every two years, you have a very low threshold to, to rehearse and or to refresh. So if you are the layperson, it would only wants to do the trick, then with an hour you're good. Um, but we're looking into adding some optional modules. For example, an optional module to how to use the pocket mask, for example. So 
So uh, how do you use it in cardiac arrest? Or uh, an optional model for citizen response. So how do you collaborate with the fire department, with, uh, with the EMS? But also some optional context-specific scenarios because you can imagine that the context, uh, if, you, if you train life support guard, uh, lifeguards, um, it's quite different because then the mannequin is not a dry mannequin in an office, but then uh, the mannequin is full of sunscreen and it's in the sand. Uh, you need to train uh, like you fight. So that means that you make some context-specific scenarios for that specific audience. So the, this is the, the direction that we're heading. We're not there yet, but this is the concept in the Netherlands. And then, if the citizen uh, went through the course, they're competent and confident, then uh, they're motivated to sign up for the system. And that's actually the fact that in the standard PowerPoint, that's the moment when we try to persuade the laypersons to sign up with the system and become uh, available as a citizen responders. Well, next to the, <coughs> the citizen responders, you need AEDs. And uh, this is a screenshot I took from a, a town next, uh, close to my house. And you can see that this town is actually very proactive because uh, in the literature, there's suggested that you need at least two AEDs uh, per square kilometer. Well, this slide is actually two square kilometers, so we need four AEDs, but there are a couple of extra. Um, so this, this city is really, really good. Um, you can also see that there is a tendency that in the city center there's a lot of AEDs, but if you look here in the residential areas, uh, the, the spread is less intensive. But I think uh, it's good to have insight in uh, where the AEDs are uh, through getting it registered with the system. And Talking about residential areas, we know that that's where the cardiac arrests take place. So we need to make effort to uh, increase the amount of available AEDs. And in the Netherlands, the Philips is collaborating with the Dutch Heart Foundation. And uh, they created this online platform where you with your neighborhood can, can create a crowdfunding uh, to get an AED in the outside cabinet in your neighborhood. So they actually pay like 40% of the total costs already. So that means that you, uh, it's a low threshold to, to get AD in your neighborhood. But this is also a problem because uh, there are many organizations and uh, you know companies and stuff who have an AAD, but they keep them inside and don't register with the system. Of course, this is not a good idea. They need to get in a, into an outside cabinet. They need to be signed up with the system. If else, they don't work. And this is also a thing that's been targeted by the Dutch Heart Foundation. They uh, issued some, some grants to, um, to make uh, the, the outside cabinets more cheaper for, for companies to buy. And then, they of course, they need to register the AED with the system. But we need to get the AEDs out. Well, next to the system, the uh, citizen responders and the AEDs, uh, we can just finally look at the future. Because in the future, we might have this. 112 operator. What is your emergency? It's my dad. I think he had a heart attack. Please help. He's not breathing anymore. Please stay calm. What's your name? Joanna. Good. Joanna, we've got your location. The ambulance drone is on its way. Remove his top shirt to uncover his torso. Uh, okay. Great. Can you go to the nearest exit? The ambulance drone is almost there. Okay. Of course, someone needs to get on the chest that was later added. <laughs> but it's about to draw now. <laughs> yeah, they later made a comment on this. So, uh, but it, just focusing on the drone. There's actually a camera in the drone. So um, the dispatcher can talk through the drone and have live uh, visual uh, on the both the scene and also the live rhythm of the, uh, of the AD. Joanna, please stay clear of your father. We'll take it from here. And of course, they live happily ever after. <laughs> but it makes you think, because it is an option, and we, I think we should consider it, uh, because it is an option to increase available AEDs. A couple of things that you need to uh, consider if you're going this direction, and uh, I'll just uh, finally take a couple of uh, comments to uh, to be prepared if, if you're heading this direction. First of all, uh, it will get a little bit more busy in the scene. 
because you have citizen responders, you got fire department, you got police department and EMS. So that's a lot of people in the room. And uh, you also need to train EMS in the non-technical way to thank the citizen responders and then have them step back because they're of course stressed as well. So you need some, some extra non-technical skills training to deal with the stressful situation. Another thing is that uh, if you get the, uh, as an EMS provider, get the call of cardiac arrest, you need to be prepared that this is the patient you will encounter. An awake person who's actually saying, yeah, yeah, I feel all right now, thank you. And this is not your typical cardiac arrest at these days, but you will see an increasing amount of these patients when you do this. Of course, it's very important that you look to the AAD. So in this case, you can see that um, up in the top over here that the EAD actually provided one defibrillation. So you know that the patient had a shockable rhythm. The problem is when this is the AAD, because then you don't know. And we have had patients who collapsed, got you know some movement in their arms, was a little stressful situation, got the AAD attached, and when the EMS arrived and they, they asked, uh, did the AAD deliver a shock, then people said no. And then they were doubting whether or not it was a cardiac arrest because the patient was awake and saying, I'm, I'm okay now. It's like, okay, that must have been a fit, a, a seizure. So they take them to the hospital um, for the neurology and get a CAT scan, uh, this is normal, and then they discharge them to home. And then uh, we, from the research part, we, we also collect the data from the AEDs and we saw VF, it was it actually a cardiac arrest. That's, that was an awkward telephone call. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> um, you know about the CAT scan, it was normal. Yeah, we need some extra investigations. <laughs> you need to get down here to the hospital and don't drive yourself. <laughs> and you need to report to the cardiology ward. Okay, so uh, it, you will need to get the data out of the AADs so you can really know what the initial rhythm was. And also be prepared that the citizens want to know how it, it went with the victim. So the victim rushes uh, to the hospital and then they're there. So in the Netherlands we got this system, it's called Heart for All, and it's a slap wrist. So the citizen responders get a slap wrist and the victim gets a slap wrist. And they have a unique code. And there's this online platform Then, if they both sign up and uh, enter the code that they want to come in contact with each other, then they get each other's contact details and they can get a cup of coffee and say how everything went. Something to consider. So we're here at the Big Sick. We're talking about critical patients. And of course, we're focusing on, on the advanced life support stuff, you know, all the airway stuff and the medication stuff and, and ECMO. And all these things are important because that's within the scope of our influence. But I hope that I've persuaded you that you can also have influence on the citizen response type of things. Because this is where we can make a difference. This is where we can get a lot of looks back to their wives and a lot of good survivors. So in summary, citizen response and cardiac arrest is essential. We need to involve and regard citizens as our colleagues. We need to train them, we need to equip them, and we need to alert them. Thank you. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, thanks for that. And that's an amazing system that you've got running there. <coughs> um, just a quick question. In terms of the responder follow-up, do you provide any debriefing for them? Because obviously for citizens, this can be a fairly confronting situation. Yes, correct. So the question is, how about debriefing? Well, uh, within the uh, Heartbeat Now system, uh, all of the citizens who responded get a questionnaire. Uh, they get a questionnaire how they went to the scene, uh, how they responded, either by text message or the app, you know, all these technical questions. But there's also some questions into the emotional things as well. So it's actually one of the questions, uh, um, do you, would you appreciate a conversation to you know, uh, have a chat on how everything went? And uh, people who say yes get called. And uh, there is this uh, uh, person who can just have a conversation how everything went. And uh, there's also an increasing uh, amount of attention from uh, professionals as well, just to, to, uh, to 
make a visit or, or have a chat or invite them. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yep. Hi, thank you very much. That was very inspiring. Um, ha are the courses, the BLS courses, are they funded in part by state or by healthcare, or, or do the citizens pay for these courses themselves? Yeah, so the uh, basic life support provider courses are uh, roughly um, like between uh, 10 and 20 or 30 euros, so it's not really uh, that expensive. Uh, so uh, it's not free, uh, but it is quite cheap. So that means that uh, they're not sponsored in any way, but they're still not that, that expensive. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. That was brilliant. So we're going to continue with the theme there. And um, Hans mentioned the apps and stuff. And uh, our next speaker is going to talk more about <coughs> um, the sort of apps you can use to and technology you can use to get citizen responders to assist in this crucial early phase of the cardiac arrest. Now in terms of introducing him, it's it's one of these things where, you know, I look around the room and there are lots and lots of really inspiring people. And the Germans, no. Uh, lots of inspiring people around the room. And then every so often in a generation you find somebody that's a true medical pioneer. And so he doesn't really need much introduction, but, uh, well, Lionel Lambert is the man that set up the ECMO service with the, the SAMU in Paris and he's rightly world famous for that and pushing the boundaries of that but now he's pushing new boundaries and um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, we speak now about this smartphone what we can do with smartphone for citizen. Uh, my conflict tank test my major is as the president of Solve Life it's a uh, apps for friends. Since many years we have a chain of survivals. We know very well the channel of survivals. Very well, very well, we try. And for us, we work a lot on the last part, in fact, from medical unit. Since we have the channel, we have just around the world 5% of survival. Probably you can have really have more. But if you take rural place, uh, campaign, everywhere, it's really not more than 5% in the world. And for this 5%, during many years now, we speak, we debate, a lot, a lot we debate. We debate about a lot of things, a lot of medical things, a lot. I like a major part of this. But anyway, probably we lose the primary target. It's a very important question today. And when I saw Congress of Cardiac Arrest today, we speak a, a lot about all these tools but not about the citizen, not so much. And this is what we need now, is to speak about citizen for cardiac arrest. Remember, no one of these tools have demonstrated survival rate, increase of survival rate, just CPR and defibrillation today. The primary drug we need is a brain. And to save a brain, all these links are not equal. We need to know this part. And now we have not to focus on this. And really, I'm a large believer of this part with the CPR. Now we need to focus on this part if we would like to do something after. Why I start to, to work on smartphone apps? Is because when I arrive on scene for ECPR, we have young people and nobody do nothing. And we can do nothing because the brain is deaf. And this is why we restart the program at the start, in fact, by the citizen. And we need to do that everywhere now. Because it's not new. If you check in Las Vegas, smart city, casino, everybody is in the same place, camera, lifeguard everywhere, very trend, AD everywhere. If you have a shock in the three first minutes, more than 70% of survival. 5%, 74%. We can do something between these two numbers, perhaps. If we check for colleagues from north of Europe, it's clear, and I like this, this slide, because you have the brain damage and 
to death. And if you, are, if you would like to have more brain damage and to be die on scene, you need no bystander. If you like to be saved because you eat a little bit too much fondue this night, we would like some of you to do CPR and defibrillation shortly. It's really clear. And probably here between EMS witness cardiac arrest and bystander cardiac arrest, the difference is the quality of the CPR. But it's not too bad for a bystander. And now we have for sure guidelines from ERC, AHA. But we have some groups try to increase survival rate by bundle, more than one thing. Uh, in Europe, we have the Global Resuscitation Alliance. In US, you have Take Care to America. You have a different philosophy. But the goal is to find what we can do to increase survival rate. And one part on this guideline is try to have a community response. And when I'm a dispatcher, I need to find someone to do CPR and EAD. From North America, HA in 2016, do, do some uh, guideline statement to use smartphone. How to do this part? This is a question now. I had some colleagues from a few years ago in the city. They try to have some citizen on call each time. And when they have a correct address, they call the citizen by phone to say, you have to reach this address. It's an amazing organization. But now we have already a smartphone. And we can use the technology. The first real paper, because we have some literature about that, a New England. What's it doing? They send a text message with the address to everybody around to reach the scene. And the results are very positive. We have a positive effect of CPR, better than telephone CPR. And we know when we work in dispatch center, you said to people, do CPR, but if this is a wife, the soon, or something else. It cannot. It can't. It's so impressive by what's happening. And the major part starts CPR when we ask in ICU when they listen to the siren of the ambulance. At the end, they cannot. we cannot ask to people witness of the cardiac arrest to do alone the CPR. They found 81% citizen at less than 500 meters. We cannot have firefighter each 500 meters. Neighbor is a solution. And they increase the CPR rate than more than 10%. That means in walking. We have other study like likely the same. And what is interesting is more than half of the time you find a citizen can do the CPR before on scene. That's a major point. The question is, and we have some talk just before, about the citizen. It's really hard sometimes for a citizen to go to go, oh, sorry, to go on scene to do CPR. Uh, in the experience in France we have for this type of apps, sometimes it's a baby, sometimes it's someone fell somewhere, or something else. In the literature, we have just one study about the stress after. We have no stress. Um, what you need to learn to your team to speak with the people on scene. It's very hard, because when you arrive on cardiac arrest, firefighter, build basic life support, go. Generally, what they're doing, they said, go outside and never speak again. Because a witness what you're doing, you leave. EMS is on scene. You leave. And nobody speak with his patient, with his people, sorry. We need to say, go outside and waiting a little bit. And after, we can go to speak with the people. It's a very important point. What we're doing to avoid this part uh, with soft life, we call back all people after, all citizens is called back to do a debrief. For technical reason, for sure, but more for psychological aspect. And what we check, we do a study, some of us have little bit stress during the three first day and after disappear completely. That means we can use people. No risk. Uh, in, this, in this paper, the major uh, 
they are afraid just by one thing, one thing, my people where I work, if I leave my work. That's a real question of uh, responsibility. What we have to do for the responsibility of the citizen. For example, in France, we just changed the law to say that pe a people go for cardiac arrest, we cannot say nothing. And if they have an accident when they, they run, it's they are covered by insurance by the state. That's an important point. Political people need to be involved. And we do today a randomized study in France, uh, in center, before and after the ARBs, training the dispatch center. It's a global thing, it's a bundle to see what we're doing. One of the major points when you use these techniques of smartphone, you need to have uh, some media. We do a lot of media everywhere. When we save someone, uh, we do a title. Uh, we do some medical conference to explain to professionals. It's important to say to your patients, go on smartphone, because if it's a doctor said, it's good. And what is very important is social media. Every day, we published someone do CPR or save a life. And now it's completely crazy. People, phone, because we have two weeks between the time they're doing and the time we published, now they call us to say, I have not my Twitter. Why? So waiting a little bit. This community is very important. And from my point of view, you know, I work in SAMU, it's a medical unit in EMS. We never seen people healthy. We just go when someone is very sick. And now what we're doing with this program, we go everywhere in the city to learn, to teach CPR, and we see the population. And when we work just with people very sick, it's very pleasant sometimes to see the population that you do a good job. And it's important for people to continue this program. And what we're doing, we do, so, we do sometimes some lunch, sorry, uh, with everybody, rescuer, EMS, and save people. It's very important to see everybody in the same place. Now some question is also important. Which algorithm on the smartphone? It's not so easy. When I start the apps, uh, the real story is I, I call Uber to say, is, I would like exactly your apps. Can you help me? Because my cardiac arrest is when I ask Uber. And the different car is my citizen go to take to the cardiac arrest. And they laugh a lot. Because the algorithm is really simple in Uber compared to what we're doing for cardiac arrest. Because for cardiac arrest, what we need to do? First of all, your citizen doesn't want in a cardiac arrest. He's not with his phone, like <laughs> No. He's in the pocket, he forgets the apps, and when he has an alert, he needs to take you. What is it? Oh, it's a apps for cardiac arrest. It's one or two minutes sometimes. But in your algorithm, if you decide after 30 seconds, if the guy said yes after one minute, what are you doing? You exclude the guy? You, he can walk or not? If you accept everybody at the end, for Paris, if I do an alert, I have 200 people said yes. It will be too much. That means the algorithm needs to be responsive all the time. When a new guy arrived, he needs to cancel another one. It's really complex, in fact. And you have to take on the calculation, where is the AD, what is the time if he go to the AD first after to the people in cardiac arrest. It's more simple if you go directly to the cardiac arrest. It's not so simple. And from a technological point of view, it's probably the part of more complex apps we can have in the phone. After we can discuss text versus apps. Text just send a, an address. Apps, you can be, uh, you have your GPS, you can be app, it's going be more impressive, but it's more complex and more expensive than text. In this study, they, they found really the apps is better than text. And when we use every day, for sure, apps have major advantage. And who can go on these apps? What is lay people? If I take probably the definition of ants, is people with training. 
if I do the same in France, it's a disaster. Why? In France, 30-40% have a training of basic life support. Just 40%. We try to work on. But if I exclude 60% of the population, no interest of my apps. That means depending where you work, if you can take everybody or not. We have decided, for example, in France to take everybody without any basic life support. Why? First of all, because we have a dispatch center with the medical people inside, and we can help people to do CPR. And when we have the first call, the first witness, we do telephone CPR. We don't ask if they have, have you a training? Yes, no, no, oh, sorry, you do nothing. No. If we are trained to learn by phone to lay people without any training, my message is not to say no training for lay people, but we can use people with no training too. And to go to reach, to take an AD on the wall, you don't need a lot of training. This part is an important point. And for people with no training, sometimes, a lot of time, they receive an alert. They are too far or they are not select. They call us back. Where can I have a training? Because in the population, they don't know we have so much cardiac arrest. They just seen on the TV show. And if you remember the study about TV show, it's 90% of survival. After, on the abs, the question of AED is a major point. This is a, a photo of uh, we take. Um, we have a lot, a lot of AED. We have major problem. First of all, the major part of AED doesn't work. The estimation, for example, in France is 40% of AED doesn't work. Why? Because people buy. They are very happy. I help everybody. But they don't buy any time any battery or patch. This is why a, a new law, for example, in France, just started the 1st January to say if you buy an AED now, you are responsible to have battery and everything. That's an important point. Second point is closing hours, because a lot of people take an AED and it's closed during the night. We cannot have an access. And if you do a large program, you need to try to have an access 24 to the AED. And last thing, we have some time people doesn't want to give the AD. They said, it's too expensive, it stay on the, on the floor. It's crazy. Anyway, it's very important to have a register of AAD on your country to know where they are and if they're working. A question is, a lot of apps doesn't want to dispatch people at home. But 80% of cardiac arrests are at home. If you don't want to save these people, you have to say it, but it's, not, it's crazy. If you explain to the first witness, your neighbor just arrived in a few seconds, can you open the door? They are very happy to see someone. And we have no issue with this art. Are we working? For example, uh, we have, when we have nothing, we, you have the map. You can call 911 by the apps, it's important because you have a location. And we know sometimes we don't know where we are. If you use the app, we know very well where you are. If we have an emergency, you receive a text and a notification, you open. We know, we said how many minutes you have to walk in. You can accept the mission. If you accept, you have the address and you can use the GPS to go. And in the same time, in the EMS dispatch, we have a, uh, a map and we can follow everybody. And we have some color. Red is to go to the cardiac arrest, green to the AED, and black is people said yes, but they are cancelled automatically by the apps because they are too far and we have enough people on scene. We can call people, we can do video conference with people to help to do CPR, for example. This is one of the movies we do to promote the apps uh, for lay people. You are on the terrace in Paris, everything doing well. We receive a call to the dispatch center. We check where we have someone. It's automatic. Oh, my God. I receive a text. 
The music. <laughs> it's important for people to know we send the professional EMS in the same time. She starts CPR. Peut arriver n'importe où. Ah. Ah. Venez sauveteur citoyen. We are better than Netherlands, we don't need AED. We, we have a recent problem now. Uh, to use this app, we need your location always. And as you know, Apple, Android, doesn't want Everybody knows your position. And when you have the app, we receive every day, or two times by day, a message to say, be careful, they use your position. And we have a lot of people cancel the position because they don't find the good button. And it's a real problem for us. We have less than 60% decrease of good position because we have this message. We send a mail to Apple and Android with all the apps, and we try to change this point for medical apps, because it's crazy. We're working very well, we save life, and because technology helps us now, said, it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. Just some number for us of life in France in six months, the last six months, we are around half of the parts of the, the country, uh, you can see we have around 40 uh, rosk, that means seven by month. And in January, for example, this month, we have 10 rosk, more than before. And what is very important, when you have a citizen on scene, 43% of rosk. It increases a lot. And for the first time, we have in some departments uh, some significant increase of survival rate. Uh, yesterday, one area called me and said, before the app, we have 5%, and now we have 26% of survival. It's working really more than epinephrine or what else? The invest is here if we would like to have more survival. We have a price uh, two years ago now in Las Vegas to the CES. It's very important to have some price because that means for population is good things. And when you have this type of price, you increase what you can do with soft life. Now soft life is a cloud in France. We do other things. We can do some emergency uh, moto to add the AED. We can do some code uh, like uh, in Netherlands. Uh, we do a lot of different sick research and everything. But what is important is what is the next step now? For example, good sum is like uh, soft life in UK, Australia. Uh, they can, we just, they, they will be, uh, it's not available yet, I think, but you take a photo and you have the pulse rate of the pigeon without any EMS on scene. That's very interesting things. And probably the next step is when you have a cardiac arrest, you clog, your shoes can detect you fell. Now, we have a, 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 a shoes, it's used for, lay pe for people uh, older, uh, oh. when they fell, they detect they are on the floor. The shoes speak, ask, everything doing well? <laughs> With no beer. Um, and if you don't answer, they call alone 911. We can detect now, you do EKG with your clock. We can detect a critical arrest probably in a few months, if it's not already done, and automatically call the apps, your neighbor can come immediately. We have a system, for example, I, I, I have a check with a company, uh, can open in your door if you fail. If it's correlated to the app, for a neighbor can come in, enter alone. You can ask EMS, and you can ask the drone to come immediately because you know where we are. But it's probably too late. The next step is your clock detect before you do your cardiac arrest or your chest pain by, because it follows the EKG always by a simple sign. In a few minutes, you will do a chest pain or cardiac arrest and can automatically EMS. Probably in the five next year, 
we can have the first prototype, from my point of view. Remember, we are not equal. Train lay people, train, train, train. Have an apps, and after we can discuss the CPR. Just after. And probably we can change the mind we have about cardiac arrest. You know, we speak a lot about the three phase electric. It's too complex. Two phase. First of all, the cardiac arrest. Or we need just CPR shock by the neighbor. And after a circulatory arrest, at this CPR. And we can decide if the patient go to the nation, survive, or die. And I see you. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested by the course of CPR and apps, we are already in May in Paris. Thank you. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Again, thank you. Any questions? Is that a, anything, any questions from anyone at the back? So I've got a question. So you said you had some trouble with Apple and stuff, with some of the apps and stuff. Did you have any difficulty from government or from the ambulance services to sort of start pushing this out? Was there any fear that these citizens were going to come and start interfering with the care? Uh, for us, we haven't, because I work in EMS system. And when I start the design of the app, the first thing I'm doing, I'm doing to the scientific society, to say, are you agree with me? Are you pushing the app to all EMS in the country? Are you agree? Do you want something in the apps? And because we discuss a lot before we have the apps on the store, we have a good people say, OK, it's good. The problem we have to, at the start, they are afraid a little bit by the responsibility. This is why I go to the government to say, I need a law. We need a law now, because we need to save life. And they said, OK, crazy. Uh, <laughs> OK, now I need a new law, but uh, uh, anyway. Um, this is why I have not so much fear. But the problem is to train now basic life, all basic life support to know you can have a citizen before you and do something you know, it's hard for basic life support because before they arrived, they have the AED, sometimes they save life. And we arrived and said, oh, you do a good job, guy. You save the life. And now it's, this is a citizen who do the same. What is the job of the basic life support between the citizen and the advanced life support? We need to train people to say we work together to do one thing, save life. And you have to understand this point, And it's a long way, it's a long training to everybody. And as medics, paramedics, nurses, the whole professions, we know what the real reality of cardiac arrest and survival is. But then when you ask someone in the public, you see this, someone touches your chest, you get up. It's always a beautiful lady that, that's touching your chest. And then the man immediately wakes up. I don't know why this happens. But th this, this unreal representation in the media of cardiac arrested TV programs. Do you think we as a profession um, of, of EMS providers should be trying to challenge that and saying you should be more realistic? This is a very nice question. Uh, I'm the first to say on TV show it's not realistic for population to know cardiac arrest we can die. But if you would like people on your apps, if you show someone 19 years old fell over very dirty. You have nobody on your apps. No, but it's, it's a true. What do you want? What is your objective? It's save life. If I would like to save life, I need people on citizen on my apps. I don't said we need to lie to people, but we need to say what they're expecting to see on TV. After when you are yourself, because you are a professional on the TV show, because you explain the apps, and you said, you know, you have uh, many cardiac arrest. The major part is 60 years old. No, no. OK, it's good, because people know. For example, it's two years we have the apps. Before, nobody knows cardiac arrest in France. Nobody knows we can have an AED take the people. Now, people know the name of survival life. People register. We have 350,000 people on the apps. Probably in two months, we have half millions. That means 
it's really people, if you said to people, you can save life just with your smartphone, they are very happy to help you. I think we have not to do so much fair ab about this point. Yes, it's, it's a good question, but the, the question is, what is your objective? Yeah. So, um, any questions from the audience, or should we go to the next step in... Uh, oh, sorry, one question. Hey, thank you. So this is probably the most American question that will ever be posted <laughs> on this forum. But uh, in the US, we do have a bit of a problem where thieves target uh, houses where ambulances recently responded to because they know that nobody will be there. Uh, is there any sort of vetting process that takes place um, for people who sign up for the app? Uh, we, ha we have not l the same issue in France, to be honest. <laughs> it's politically correct. Um, no, we have some area where it will be more complex. Uh, what we've seen, we, we, we published a study two years ago about this area. They have more di dying people for cardiac arrest. The survival rate is less because they have less AD on the area. They have less people trained. And now it's a project in this area to say to the population, we, go, we, we arrive to help you to have more survival. But you need to have a large work with political with people live in this area to say, okay, we are rift, we put an AED on the wall, but you have to explain to everybody, this AED is for everybody. Don't destroy it. We have no limits today. Just the limits we have, it's uh, on the dispatch center, if you have some risk, it's, uh, it's uh, attack or something else, we, we close the apps, but we use the apps to send a message to everybody, go far away. This, the, this area is protected now. Thank you so much. So, um, so next up, we, we've gone from citizen response without technology, well, so without app technology to the use of the apps and the more modern kind of ways of activating people. And now we sort of go to the other end of the chain. So, Alice Houtin is a, a, a PhD physician in Paris, has been working for the past four years on the SAMU ECMO team. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, how that team works and how ECPR for out of hospital cardiac arrest. So this is zooming forwards from the absolute basics of just getting your hands on the chest and doing that to absolute, you know, space science. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the um, organizing committee for having me here. And I would also like to thank Lionel for, for finding another subject to talk about, because otherwise he would be here talking about ECPR. So <laughs> um, the idea is to talk to you um, about pre-hospital ECPR and to sort of explain the, um, the demonstration that happened last night to show you how things work. Um, and the, the real message is that um, pre-hospital ECPR works in some places and it's, it's a growing project around the world, but the idea is really to have your system work for refractory cardiac arrest. So I think if we're all here, we sort of believe in, in progress and I think there is no question anymore on the um, impact and the possibility of ECPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. The, the, the question is really how. Um, so ECPR has appeared in the guidelines since about 2015. Um, the idea is that things are, I mean, ECPR is on the guidelines, but it's still something that you can consider. It's not something that you, you really have to do, but it's something that you can consider. Um, this message has been confirmed in the latest update, um, in the 2019 update. Um, it, it's still something that you may consider um, in selected patients as a rescue ther therapy. Um, so it's all these ifs that you have to go through. Um, and it has to be done by skilled, pro skilled providers. So th there are all these things that are said, but in the end, there's nothing that you really have to do. Um, but it, it is something that you do need to anticipate if you want um, eCPR to work in your system. 
So eCPR for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, yes, um, but you do need to answer a few questions before you go ahead with eCPR. Um, some of them are when, um, when do you go to eCPR, where, basically is a question that um, we've tried to answer, um, and for who, because basically eCPR is not the answer for all patients. So to start with eCPR when, um, we all know that um, basically as time goes, the probability of survival goes down. Um, eCPR is just a way to sort of, um, low, to sort of ease the, the, the way that this, this curve goes down. And basically eCPR um, increases the probability, probability of survival um, to discharge. But basically you do need to go fast, um, otherwise um, you won't have any survivors. So the idea is to see who are the people who are getting eCPR and who survive. And basically, um, you do need to go fast when you want to have your patients under eCPR. And over the past um, decade, probably, um, the idea has come up that you need to have these patients under eCPR within 60 minutes of collapse. Otherwise, your survival rate is going to go down very fast. Um, and more recently, um, uh, Jason Bartos has just published this study um, to show that eCPR does help you get that survival rate up um, with neurologically intact patients. The idea is really when do you go from conventional CPR to eCPR? Um, is it, do you need to go from one therapy to another around 30 minutes? How do you organize your system? And how early? is not too early, so it's really a question of how do you organize things to have people under eCPR, but in the end, don't go to eCPR too early because it is something that is um, very um, um, morbid for patients and that, that you do have a certain number of complications that you, you want to avoid if you can go just for with conventional CPR. So basically, you do need to organize time because time will go by much faster than you think, um, especially for those of you who do pre-hospital eCPR. You know that time flies by, um, and you need to make sure to organize things so that you don't end up at 60 minutes saying, oh god, I'm still on the scene, what do I do? So the idea is to stay on the scene as little as possible, but you do need to anticipate on transport time, and there are actually two aspects to the transport time. There's the transport in itself, so once the patient is in, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. But what we know from pre-hospital medicine is that the most difficult aspect is sometimes taking the patient out of the place where he is into the ambulance, and that in itself can take a lot of time. So you need to consider staying on site as little as possible if you're going to go for in-hospital eCPR. Um, try to go to the hospital as fast as possible once your patient, patient is in the ambulance. And you do need to keep in mind that the cannulation in itself does take time. Um, and there are centers where they are very, very um, performant and it takes them just below 10 minutes. But in most, of most centers, it does take you uh, between 10 and 20 minutes to cannulate. So keep that in mind when you try to organize your, your system. So once you've said that, um, that you need to have your patient under eCPR within 60 minutes, how do you organize things and where do you put the patient under eCPR? Basically, in-hospital eCPR is um, one of the main um, answers. The problem is that load and go is not always that easy. Um, and it does take you quite some time to go through, tra through traffic, sorry. Um, and we've seen these past few years that traffic has only been getting worse. Um, and it's not because you have an eCPR center um, in your vision, out, just, just out the window, that it will take you a few minutes to get there. If you need to take the patient out the window, it's going to take you many more minutes than you, th than you think. And having the firefighters um, get the system here in itself can take 15 to 20 minutes. So you do need to anticipate as soon as you get on the scene, if you know it's going to take you time to get the patient out, when you get there, tell them, I'm, I'm going to need your help. If, if the patient has ROSC, we're going to have to get him out either way. Um, if he doesn't, we're going to need to move very fast. So you know, deal with it. Just help us out. Uh, find a solution for us to have the patient in the ambulance as soon as possible. And we've actually seen this um, in Paris, basically, with um, 
buildings, but it, even when we intervene outside of Paris in houses, it can be a challenge to get the patient out of his house or his bedroom. And sometimes we also need to have the patient out the window, and that again takes very much time. So load and go is not, very, is not always easy, and distance is clearly not the only problem we have. Um, and other centers have been working on this, and in another city of France called Nancy, um, they've tried to optimize the strategy as much as possible to limit the time on scene, um, transfer the patient as soon as possible, um, and of course organize the cannulation. But even with an optimized strategy, they've shown that the mean low flow time, so the time between the cardiac arrest and the eCPR activation of the pump, was the mean low flow was 80 minutes. So we are beyond the 60 minutes that we hope for. And clearly, if you decide to take the patient to the hospital, you need to make sure that security um, for, the, for the crew is something that you concentrate on. Um, and beyond security, obviously, which is one of the objectives, you need to make sure that your patient gets optimal CPR wi while he's being transported to the hospital. Otherwise, it's useless, to, you know, going 30 or 40 kilometers out, um, if your patient for a long period of time is not getting high quality CPR, then it's useless. So basically, that is how um, the concept of pre-hospital um, came to the mind of Lionel, I guess, a, a few years ago. It's to try to get rid of this whole part of extraction and transportation time to the patient, to try to bring the low flow down from the 100 minutes that we had at the time to 60 minutes, which, are the, which is the maximum low flow that we're hoping for. And clearly, when we go back to this curve, the idea is to go to bring the, the, the low flow down from the 120 minutes that we had at the time to 60 minutes, and by in that mean, bringing the, the chances of survival um, higher. <coughs> So once we've defined the timeline that we have to fit in um, and we've sort of organized our system, the idea is really to keep in mind that all patients are not eligible for eCPR. And clearly, um, Yanel has mentioned this um, earlier, there's been a shift um, of, of mind scene in the past few years, um, which is that clearly the objective is not to have ROSC objective now is to have patients leaving the hospital and going back to their normal lives, going back to work. Um, and in that mean, we need to save the brain during the whole process. So clearly, um, these are the most important links of the chain. And even though you have eCPR at this end, if the patient has not had optimal um, CPR from bystanders, then it's useless going to eCPR. So clearly, um, when we uh, try to organize patient selection, um, we do need to try to have a notion of the no-flow itself. Um, was it minutes before the patient got CPR? Was it seconds? It's really difficult to know. And when we try to, um, to ask people once the patient is in the hospital, we actually always end up finding that the, the no-flow is longer than it was said initially. You know, bystanders or, or families are going to tell you, the patient collapsed, my husband collapsed, I started CPR immediately. But in the end, they panicked, they called a friend, the neighbor, and then by the time they called um, 911 or the SAMU, it, al it had already been minutes. And then by the time they start CPR, it's been another set of minutes. So sometimes the no-flow goes from nothing to 10 minutes, and that's a real problem. So beyond the no-flow, cardiac rhythm, initial cardiac rhythm is something that is an information that we're going to collect. How is BLS? Was there a community response? Was there high quality BLS? What's the patient history, if we can have it? And what were the circumstances of cardiac arrest? Basically, if the patient arrests um, while he was doing sports um, with a um, bystanders that started CPR, an available a AED very fast. Um, things are better than if he, if he arrested in his, in his house, in his bed, and he was found in cardiac arrest by his wife. And clearly, the idea is try to aim for people who have a reversible cause to their, their a suspected reversible cause to their cardiac arrest. But in the end, we found that despite all this information that we can get, 
One of the best markers that we've identified over the past few years is the existence of signs of life during CPR. Because those are things that you're going to see when you're on the scene. And you're going to see if the patient has spontaneous movements, which is rare but does happen. If the patient has gasps after 30 minutes of CPR. If the patient has pupillary response. Those are things that show that the patient has had high quality CPR until the time you get there. And clearly, we found that these signs of life are, better, um, are a better marker than biology, even if we have access to, um, to blood gas by the time we go on to CPR. Um, we've decided not to base our decision on biology because, for example, here, um, this patient has had 17 of lactate, and this is him here. Um, yeah, this is a patient that was put under ECMO, um, who'd had bystander CPR, high quality BLS, um, who was taken care of by the mobile ICU. And despite all that, he had a bad blood gas, but then he was put under, uh, under ECPR because he had signs of life at that time. And this was him six weeks later. Um, so that's about all of the questions that um, we'd that I'd sort of uh, outlined in the, p in, in the initial um, diagram. And the idea is now to show you how it works for us in Paris. Um, I think even if the guidelines get better concerning ECPR, they will never tell you how to organize things because it will never be possible to have one type of um, organization. The idea is to make things work in your setting depending on how things are organized in the pre-hospital setting, depending on if you're in an urban or rural area. So really, there is no one way to make things work. It's just make it work the best you can. So in Paris, everything sort of starts in the dispatch center, where we get the call for um, a witness cardiac arrest. And basically, the idea is to send all the means out at the same time. So we get um, guided by standard CPR. We, set, we start the app. Um, get BLS and ALS teams out at the same time because there are not as many um, uh, ALS teams as BLS. And then we activate the ECPR team at the time of the cardiac arrest. So this has been men mentioned before. Bystander CPR is very important. Um, BLS is delivered in Paris by the firefighters. And this is really the time where high quality CPR starts. Because um, for um, cardiac arrest, we usually get two teams of um, firefighters, two teams of three. Um, say they, they're really able to rotate to deliver high quality CPR. And this is where um, the timekeeping starts, which is really something that we're going to concentrate on to limit interruptions and everything. So we really want to try to make the optimal chain of survival um, go through this. The mobile ICU is the, the mobile ICU team from the SAMU most of the time, um, where we have a, a physician on team. And the, phy the physician is going to be responsible, basically, um, for uh, the high quality CPR, uh, um, making sure everything continues. We do, at that time, uh, decide to for decide about drug administration, whether it be epinephrine or amiodarone. We deal with the airway. Um, patients are um, intubated so that we can have an idea of entitled CO2. Um, and basically, the idea is to to try to orient um, the patient to ECPR or not as soon as possible if there is no ROSC within the first 10 to 20 minutes. And so that's why the, um, the ECPR team is dispatched very early, is to make sure that uh, the ECPR team presents on the scene as early as possible. The idea is not to have the patient under ECPR before he's actually had um, conventional CPR, um, but the idea is to keep in mind that we want the patient under ECPR within 60 minutes. So basically, the time where we shift from one to the other is around 20 minutes of ALS. Um, when, once the patient has had a number of analysis of um, rhythm analysis, um, by that time he's also had um, at least four or five milligrams of epinephrine, depending on um, when the, the ALS team got there. So that's the time where we decide to go for ECPR or not. Just to give you a few examples, um, this is the picture that Lionel would have shown you, obviously, because <laughs> he was there. Um, and this is the ECPR that took place in the, in the Louvre. Um, unfortunately, I usually find myself in much more, much less friendly environments. <laughs> um, 
either in small um, places where it gets very crowded because we have the BLS teams. Sometimes we have bystanders that are still there. Um, we've got the ALS team, the, the ECMO team, so it can get very, very crowded. Um, this was a picture where we, we were actually having a patient um, put under a CPR because he'd been electrified and we found out later that um, there was actually still electricity in the walls. Um, so that was pretty scary. This was on the eighth floor of um, one of the Parisian buildings in a very narrow um, corridor. And this was actually uh, a time where uh, Zach Shiner was visiting and we actually had an ECMO case on the, on the highway around Paris. Um, so that was not friendly at all, but it was, you know, you still need to do um, what you got to do. Basically, once the patient is under a CPR, you do sort of tend to um, relax because you, you, you've gained more time. Um, but basically, the idea is that you do need to start post-DCPR treatment as soon as possible. Make sure you optimize hemodynamic status. Try to limit hyperoxia. So we do have the patient and the, the ECMO machine under an oxygen mixer. Um, we systematically sedate patients and put them um, through uh, therapeutic hypothermia. The idea is to take the patient to the hospital and make sure we take them to the right place where they can um, be treated for the cause of their cardiac arrest. So patients are all taken basically to the cath lab to uh, make sure that they don't have an, a coronary occlusion at the origin of their cardiac arrest. And then they're, they're taken to a specialized ICU where they can be taken care of. Basically, the, the procedure has been evolving over the past decade. Um, it started in 2011, and this is actually the, the series of patients that were taken care of between 2011 and 2015. And clearly, patient selection has evolved um, over these years, and as well as the protocol in itself. So we've, as I've mentioned earlier, we've um, get gotten better in terms of patient selection with signs of life. Um, and we've also um, tried to define the protocol better. And what we call the global eCPR strategy now um, involves pre-hospital eCPR as much as possible. We try to limit um, epinephrine doses. And we do take the patients directly to the cath lab. And we found out that when we in, in that population, when we take the patients that had neither patient selection um, nor the, the, the global eCPR protocol, then the, the survival of these patients was around 3%. But then if we take patients that had been well selected, although they did not have the, the whole protocol, then survival goes up to 19%. And then if we make sure that we've selected patients well and that we've taken care of them, um, giving them the whole the, the global eCPR strategy or the, the whole eCPR bundle, then survival rate can go up to 38 per 38%. Clearly, as I mentioned, these patients are, are taken to the cath lab and um, we found out that more than two-thirds of patients actually have a coronary occlusion at the origin of their cardiac arrest. And what's interesting to see is that these patients, um, most of the time, have very proximal lesions that probably explain um, the fact that they are in refractory cardiac arrest despite all the, the optimal chain of survival that they've had. And they, al they also, most of the time, have multiple lesions, multiple um, coronary lesions um, that are treated at the same time. Clearly, as I mentioned earlier, the idea is really to have eCPR early, but we've um, as the, the, the team developed over the past few years, um, we've been um, intervening inside of Paris, but we are also called by um, other departments outside of Paris who do not have access to pre-hospital eCPR um, on a normal basis, but who don't either have access to in-hospital eCPR. Um, and we found out that um, even though for these patients the, the mean low flow is clearly longer because we, it does take us more time to get there, um, in this small series of 21 patients um, with a mean low flow of around 110 minutes, we did have 2% survivors, uh, sorry, uh, two, survive with two survivors, which is a 10% survival rate. And what's interesting to see, and it's not something that um, I'm really going to talk about further, but is that among these patients, two actually became organ donors. And it is something that you will, or that you, th that you already know, but it, 
in the patients that are put under eCPR, a certain number actually go into brain death and become organ donors. And uh, although it's important to keep in mind that it's not the primary objective of this patient care, um, a certain number of patients will um, um, evolve to, you know, to, to give to the community, I guess, even though they don't survive themselves. Um, they will be um, a good asset to the community in the sense that they will um, become organ donors. Clearly, um, we're very happy to see that many other cities have started um, pre-hospital eCPR um, in France, of course, but also in Europe, in the United States, and um, in Australia. Um, so the idea is really, as I mentioned earlier, to make things work where you are. Um, I didn't mention the technique we used, the, the cut down that we did last night, but if you have any questions, we can talk about that. But clearly, use the technique that you know how to use and to make sure it works in your, in your system. So just to conclude, you do need an optimal chain of survival. You need to anticipate things. You need to train your team and all the people who are going to work with you. So train the BLS, the ALS teams, um, the people who are going to be taking care of the patient in the hospital, because it is a very um, multidisciplinary care. Um, and really, eCPR is just part of a bundle of care. Um, if we have time, this is just a short video. Do we have time? Yes. <coughs> So this was an eCPR case that was actually in, in one of the big train stations of a, a witness cardiac arrest. And we, al we actually at the, uh, on that day had James Manning who was vidi visiting from the US and who was filming the whole thing. So we tried to make it a short film. So as you saw, you might have seen yesterday, this is the, the cut down technique where we do an incision a few centimeters bef below the, uh, the groin. B below the inguinal ligament, sorry. And then we do blunt dissection with the fingers um, because as you can see, um, everything is moving due to the, the um, mechanical compression. So you, we try to use scissors as less as possible, as little as possible to avoid doing any vascular damage. You can see here that the we actually poke the needle just below the incision that we've made um, to make sure that the cannula is going to be stabilized um, by the skin at that point. And it also makes sure that um, we don't poke the vessel perpendicular, but really in, a, in, in more of a 45 degree uh, angle to make sure we go um, into the vessel more than um, through the vessel. And so then we use the Seldinger technique. And since we've done a lot of dissection, we actually don't need to do um, too much dilation at that time. So in, in, in the way things are organized, um, in the team, we actually have one paramedic, uh, one anesthetic, anesthetic nurse, sorry, and one physician. Um, and so the machine is actually primed by the nurse um, while the, the physician does the, the insertion. And all the equipment is given to us by the, by the paramedic. And most of the time, the, so the eCPR physician um, will have as a helper the, the mobile ICU physician who's on the scene first. So that's the, the venous cannula that was put in first. That was actually the first time I was on the scene um, helping out, so it was pretty useless. But the, th the idea is that, that the, the cannulator, the ECMO physician, um, can be helped by whoever is there. Um, the idea is really to have the, the person holding the retractors, and then the, the physician deals with the, with the rest. What's a bit complex is actually that um, by the time we get there, um, the patient has had the... the, the conventional optimal CPR and by the time we get there um, 
there's a sort of responsibility shift that mm -hmm. goes from everyone who's there to the, the ECMO physician who's there not only to decide if the patient is an ECMO candidate or not. Um, so basically, if you say the ECMO candidate, the patient is not an ECMO candidate, then everything stops. And that's sometimes a, a responsibility that's sort of difficult to, um, to, to have. Um, but then the idea is that not only does the, the ECMO physician have to do the cannulation, but that's also a time where you need to make sure that um, everything is ready to then transport the patient to the hospital, um, make sure um, vasopress vasopressors are being prepared, um, sedation is being prepared. So th the role is actually much wider than just cannulating the patient. So this is the arterial cannula going in. And as you see here, there's a, 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 th a three-way um, cock stop, I can't remember what you call it, but, um, and this is actually um, what we use to do the reperfusion of the leg because we do, um, we insert the reperfusion catheter at the same time to make sure um, there are no ischemic com complications. So when, the, so when both cannulas are in and the circuit is ready, then we do the underwater seal to connect the, the circuit to the cannula. So that's the time where we go on pump. And as you can see, this is, we had one of the firefighters holding light. Basically, lighting is really a, an issue. <laughs> um, and, and we need to make sure that we have optimal lighting as well. It's a bit slow. There you go. Et hey, vite la bouteille d'oxygène et d'air là. C'est Christ. Allez vite vite vite. vite. So that's it. Go 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 go. Hurry up here. So you, you do need to make sure everyone's on board and to make sure everyone's following what you're doing. Thanks a lot. And if just to remind you, if people are interested in um, ECPR or pre-hospital, we uh, we've set up a course that's been running twice a year, and next course is in May. So thanks a lot. Okay, so deeply impressive stuff. Um, sorry, any questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you so much for this beautiful talk. Thank you. Willem um, Utrecht. I was wondering, can you give some comments on the complication rate? And for example, people uh, who have uh, ventricular fibrillation with uh, subecchno uh, hemorrhage, for example, can you comment on complication rates with the ECMO patients? Um, well, we actually, um, concerning failure rates for, uh, first, um, we actually have not that many um, failures of implementation. Uh, so that's one important thing. And we, ac we don't have um, more, uh, we don't have a higher failure rate than uh, for in-hospital ECPR. Um, one of the main complications um, that uh, we had initially was um, ischemic legs. Um, but since we do, we have um, systematic reperfusion, that's really not an issue anymore. Um, at the beginning, we also had um, a lot of bleeding, um, especially since we're doing a cut down. Um, well it's actually especially and not really because the idea with the cut down is that you, you actually visualize very well the vessels that you're cannulating. So the idea is really that you're going to poke the vessel once. And in that mean, the idea is that there will be less hematoma normally. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and because of the bleeding at first, we, we did have um, systematic blood that was brought on the scene so that patients were transfused. Um, but now we don't need that anymore. Um, and then you meant uh, complications, neurological complications, or um, we've actually ha haven't cannulated patients that w had cardiac arrest due to um, cerebral lesions. Um, but those are the main complications I can think of. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, signs of life, what do you include in that? So, the signs of life are either spontaneous movements, um, gasp, and um, pupillary response. Um, but we have, we're sort of trying to make, to make that criteria more fine, I guess, and clearly, um, Gasp and movements are probably better signs of life in terms of prognosis than just pupillary response. Yep. 
last question because we're a bit pressed for time, I'm afraid. Uh, how long does this patient stay on ECMO and uh, do you have problems with clotting? So it's really, it, it really depends on how the patient evolves. Um, the patients that do really well are usually under ECPR for 24 hours or, or less if possible. Um, but some people stay on, e on ECPR for days or weeks. Um, um, and we do have um, quite a bit of clotting, um, but the, um, the, the patients are taken uh, off ECPR by surgeons, and so they, they do have to take care of the clotting at that time, but um, the clotting has not been at most of the time at the origin of ischemic complications or, or other. Um, so that was one of the questions that we, we discussed recently with um, uh, uh, Josh Isle, who's one of the, he's a, an Australian physician from Melbourne, and he was actually telling us that what they do in, in Melbourne at the, at the Alfred Hospital to avoid that clotting is that they actually flush the cannula with um, heparinized saline. Um, it's not something we do, but it's probably something that can help have less clotting. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's Thank absolutely you. fascinating. <laughs> and, um, obviously, I think these conversations will continue at the bar and a lot of questions there. Now, whilst we set up for the next talk, I just want to tell you about a couple of other things happening today. So this afternoon, uh, if you are going to go up the mountain, uh, there's a, uh, a workshop by Ross Fisher uh, on present presentation skills uh, presentation skills uh, and he'll be teaching those of you uh, who can how to present so we'll start at the top of the train um, at the cafe at the top of the train but if you look on the Facebook page you can put your name down for it and then um, if you don't want to make that one if you fancy skiing then ski across to the blowhard um, probably pronouncing it wrong uh, the blowhard um, uh, uh, cable car and just above that is the blue restaurant where he'll run the second session so continuing on the theme of resuscitation um, the next talk is from a German physician, Bernd, Bernard Bottinger, if I'm saying this correctly? <laughs> yep, who's, a, who's a v uh, high up in the Resuscitation Council in... Uh, in Sorry, let me actually... This is now actually me cocking up the presentation skills. Uh, so he's the chair of the department uh, of ICU and anaesthesia in Cologne, and they have a department with 200 anaesthetists with 50 ICU beds, and um, they give over 35,000 anaesthetics uh, a year. Uh, he's the senior director for the Resuscitation um, uh, European Resus Council, and he has been developing research on resuscitation for many, many years. Um, and he was instrumental in developing the World Restart a Heart Day. And what he's going to talk to us today about is the Kids Saves Lives campaign. Um, and I think this should sort of tie up nicely, especially as some of us are going into our old years. And I'm not looking at Mike here, but, um, but it's about time that we made sure our children knew how to resuscitate us after that fondue. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and good morning, everyone. Anyone in the room who are already trained school children in CPR, please raise your hands. So a lot in this room, I would say. So we have learned a lot this morning, and I would like to be a little bit more interactive with you. And first, this is, this is, not, this is not an ophthalmologist's test. It's just the number three. And I would like to ask you, what is the third leading cause of death in so-called civilized nations? No, number five. Number three is ca cardiac arrest, sudden, sudden cardiac arrest is number three. That's what we learned this morning, isn't it? And <coughs> next thing I would ask, I would like to ask you, what kind of measure in cardiac arrest is associated with a tripling in survival rate? Please help me. Is it, uh, is it, yeah, early CPR, early intervention. It's better than epinephrine, ECMO, anything else. And next, number three is, what three things are most important to teach lay people doing CPR? Number one. Number two. 
Number one is check, isn't it? Check for life. Number two, call for help. And number three, compress. So the three things that we need to educate people is check, call, compress. That is a must. And then we can also speak about ventilation or AD, but check, call, compress is the most important thing. And I would like to start with a video that we did with some students in Cologne. It's in German language, but you have English subtitles and it is self-explaining, so please enjoy and I hope it will work. Hi Freunde, ich bin's, euer Flo. Ich habe heute was ganz Besonderes für euch. Wir pranken heute meine Schwester Marina. Und dazu habe ich mir tatkräftige Unterstützung ins Boot geholt. Vom Papa. Hallo. <lacht> Schönes gekocht und überall in der Wohnung Kameras aufgestellt. Und wenn die Marina gleich von der Vorlesung nach Hause kommt, wird der Papa in die Küche gehen und einen Herzinfarkt vortäuschen. Oh. Wir sind gespannt, wie die Marina reagiert und hoffen und, und wünschen euch viel Spaß. Sorry. Ja, siehst du die noch oder wie? It was a lot of fun for them. So? Okay, perfekt. Thema, denn es kann jeden treffen. Allein in Deutschland sterben jährlich bis zu 70.000 Menschen an Folgen eines Herzstillstands. 60 Prozent der Fälle passieren zu Hause. Und nur jeder Dritte kann. Dabei ist helfen so einfach. Informiert euch auf www.wiederbelebung.de. Okay, so if you like this, you can download it from the website of the German Resuscitation Council. So this is the top my topic for this morning, Kids Save Lives. So this is really very ba basic. You may have seen the Kids Save Lives logo. And what touched me most in my professional life over the last years was when I met some years ago Nick and Kea. Nick had a cardiac arrest because he had some cardiac abnormalities in school in the great pause or break. Many pupils and many teachers have been around. He went into ventricular fibrillation. What happened? They called the EMS. EMS took 12 minutes until it arrives. Nothing else happened. After some few minutes, a teacher did something. What did he do? What are we all learning in our first aid courses? They put him into recovery position. But we all know it does not matter whether you die in the prone or in the recovery position. 
Unfortunately, she was educated in CPR by the German Red Cross from the age of eight years on, and she then arrived and together with her friend did CPR, and he survived, and he is again one of the best in his class. And his mother said, knowing how to do CPR and doing CPR should be a civic duty, and that is a driving motivation behind our activities over the last years. This is the start of the German uh, national initiative on lay people education in CPI. I will come back to this later. And this is of what will we die in industrialized nations. Out of hospital cardiac arrest is number three killer. In the European Union, we have 350,000 unsuccessful CPRs per year. That means EMS is going there but no final survival. This is 1,000 patients every day. This is as if two jumbo jets would crash down every day, every day in the year in Europe without any survivors. Think about what would we do, what would we initiate? That is the amount of the problem we have here. In Germany, it's just one plane, 200 inhabitants every day, I would say. And it's very easy to do something against. And when modern CPR was, um, um, was detected by Kuvenhoven and Knickerbocker in the early 60s of the last century, they published all that is needed is to hands. And that is an extremely good message because you don't need to be a doctor or a paramedic or a nurse. All that is needed is to hands. Everyone can do CPR. Because what is most important we know that the emergency medical service probably will arrive after eight minutes, nine minutes, or ten minutes. But unfortunately, the brain can survive for only three to five minutes only. So there is a time window. We have learned this this morning very clearly for lay resuscitation, for any interventions that bridging the time until EMS arrival. And we will see in a few minutes that we have three times more survivors with lay CPR. And you have seen this already. It's new in the ERC guidelines. We will publish some new guidelines in October this year. You probably know. And again, I have a question to you. Does anyone know what this is? If you ask small children, they, they cannot tell you what to do with something like this. We have already heard why this is important with regard to CPR besides first responder systems. Telephone CPR is very important. Number needed to treat is seven, and I hope that in all your countries, telephone CPR is very well established. This is unfortunately not the case in Germany. We are only doing 30% telephone CPR. We all know the chain of survival, and we all know, after this session now, the new chain of survival published by Charles Deakin some two years ago. The first chain is by far, and this is based on real data, the most important. Um, you can do many, many um, sophisticated things there, but if you lost the patient in the first minutes, it does not make any difference whether you do this or that. Low rates of bystander CPR over the last years. This is Germany. Germany was very, very bad some years ago. The Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands have been found to be much better. You have seen some data like this. And therefore, there it was a political challenge in Germany. And we took Denmark as a blueprint. And in Denmark, they initiated a national initiative to improve cardiac arrest management with bystander intervention over a 10 years period. And as you can see here, they started with bystander CPR rates, as we had in Germany some years ago, of about 20%. One in five did um, bystander CPR. And then <coughs> they increased the rate to uh, about 50%. Now they, they are above 60 or maybe close to 70%. As far as I know, they did a lot of different interventions. And one of the most important interventions was mandatory educating, um, education in resuscitation in elementary schools starting in the year 2005. This further increased the rate of bystander CPR in Denmark. And this was associated, as you can see here, with a threefold increase in survival following out of hospital cardiac arrest in 10 years. Threefold increase. So this is the second number three for this morning. And I know that we have a lot of doctors, paramedics, and nurses in this room. And I would like to ask you again, 
do you know any intervention, any drug, any surgical procedure, any, I don't know what, technical, um, sophisticated thing, let's say of in the last 50 years that was associated with a threefold increase in survival in a deathly entity. <laughs> Do you know any, any intervention? Pardon? Vaccination. Maybe. Maybe penicillin some, some many, many years ago, but there are not so many. This is extremely effective and it is a low budget intervention that really costs nearly nothing. So this was a political success in Denmark. We used this as a blueprint. If we would extrapolate this for Germany, that would mean 10,000 additional survivors every year. In Europe, 100,000 and in the world, maybe 300,000 additional survivors in the year. We started educating school children more than 10 years ago during the ERC Congress in Cologne. This was in the City Hall of Cologne 10 years ago. We developed a curriculum for school children education in CPR. You can download this from our website. We also developed a modular teaching training course for teachers. So our principle is to educate teachers so that they can then educate school children in CPR, check, call, compress. We also asked the European Union for um, political support and we have received uh, four, four, uh, 400 signatures from members of the European Parliament that signed a written declara declaration for a European resus re, um, re, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation awareness week or awareness day. We visited the European Commission on Health some years ago and probably you will remember these two young people here. Um, we uh, took them to Brussels and educated the European Commission on Health in how, we, how, it is, uh, how it is possible to do CPR. We have been in the press in, in Brussels and in Belgium and all over. And then we have established the European Restart a Heart Day <coughs> with the help of the members of the European Parliament. The first European Restart a Heart Day was established in 2013. And the, the focus was already on children saving lives, as you can see here. And then we approached the WHO, the World Health Organization, and we said, please help us to announce that school children education in resuscitation is important and everyone in the world should do, should do this. Nationwide implementation of modules of only two hours per year on the topic resuscitation from class seven, maybe they are around 10, 11 or 12 years on. And we are really very proud that we have received a letter from the World Health Organization in 2015 stating that they have endorsed our Kids Save Life statement. So school children education is now recommended by WHO all over the world. And that motivates us to um, put Kids Save Lives as the motto to the fourth European Restart a Heart Day in 2016. And we have been active in many countries in Europe and elsewhere. And this led to a legislation that school children education in CPR is mandatory by law. In the meantime, in six European countries, but I'm sorry, this is not a European country probably anymore. <coughs> but fortunately, they produced this law in UK just a few days before the Queen sent the whole parliament home. And it is, it is a suggestion in another 24 European countries, so we have been pretty successful so far. We are doing a lot of education and we have produced a lot of educational material for children. This is from the Italian colleagues of the Italian Resuscitation Council. And sorry, and this is our national initiative, the start of our national initiative in Germany. And it's very interesting because at all times when we are doing this, we have nice weather and the sun is shining and there are no clouds in the sky. This, uh, this was our German health minister, some very m important people over there. And here you can see, you remember these two? He's a little bit taller than, he's growing very fast. <coughs> and the motto is check, call, compress, prüfen, rufen, drücken, you can save a life. National initiative in Germany. And this is the German health minister in the school of Nick and Kea, of these two young people. And this is in Mainz in Germany. 
This is Dr. Hu, the pediatrician from the University of Mainz. They went into a school in the morning and trained school children in CPR there. And in the afternoon, about three years ago, this young lady, 15 years old, collapsed because of a Brugada syndrome. And then the school children that, uh, that have been trained in the morning in CPR resuscitated her successfully. And when the EMS arrived, uh, the EMS doctor said they did such a good job that he didn't want to take over. We are exporting this. Do you know where this is? Which country is it? That in Europe? Bella Italia, yes. You can see the weather, the sun is shining. This is three years ago when a, a law was produced by the um, Minister of Education in Italy that it is a must to educate school children all over the country. It's, it's, it's by the law in Italy right now. This is in Cologne, the carnival in Cologne. <laughs> you enjoy it? <laughs> it was, we, we had about 12,000 um, people uh, dancing during carnival. Most of them had some alcohol, but it was a very nice educational scenario. This is, in Tur this is in Turkey, this is Greece, Kids Save Lives. You can see the sun is shining again. This is in Hungary some months ago, last summer. And did, did, does did this help in Germany? As you can see here, before we started with our, with our political interventions in Germany, the German anesthesiologists, together with the German Resuscitation Council, lay resuscitation rates have been far below 20%. Then they increased until up to 40% in 2018. Our goal is to reach 50% this year. We will see whether we will be able to do this. These are data from the German Resuscitation Registry. We would say it's already a political success. And if we extrapolate the data from Denmark, that would mean that we already save an additional 7,000 lives per year in Germany by this political intervention. And what's going on right now? So we exported the European Restart Heart Day to the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. We suggested to them, let's do it worldwide in 2017. And that ended up with a, um, with a World Restart Heart Day from 2018 on. So all ILCOR members, including the American Heart, the Australians, the Canadians, the Africans, and the Asians, um, they decided to have a World Restart a Heart Day from 2018 on. This is the logo. It's always on October 16, and the anesthesiologists in the room would probably notice that October 16 is the World Anesthesia Day. Everyone in the world can save a life. All that is needed is two hands. We have it in 36 different languages. Does anyone know which language this is? Pardon? Burmese, and it's, um, it's Singali from Sri, from Sri Lanka. Um, check, call, compress is the motto. So these are three interventions that increase survival rate by three times, I would say. In Europe 2018, a total of more than 410,000 people have been trained in BLS in the world, close to 700,000. This is the new chain of survival. Last year in October, just a few weeks ago, we have trained more than one million people worldwide and we have reached with social media campaigns more than 150 million people. So we believe that is probably an impact on worldwide survival. In 2019, World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists have been with us and the International Red Cross. The International Red Cross has sent a toolkit out to 192 member states in the world. Does anyone know how many countries we have in the world? <laughs> I had to look it up at Wikipedia. We have 194, so only two countries were missing. So this is um, the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. This is the boss of the International Federation of the Red Cross. This is Italy. We always ha have nice weather. This is Canada. This is Australia. This is America. This is, um, this is um, India and Saudi Arabia. This is Cologne. And um, we need probably another two minutes. 
and we can even start educating people, the school children and children in the kindergarten um, at a very early age and I'm wondering whether someone of you knows this audio from London, UK, where a four-year-old called the EMS. Does anyone know that? Maybe we can have... Hello, please, what is your emergency? Hello, I'm Roman. Four years old. He's at home. And where are you? At home as well. Can you do me a favour? Can you go and get Mummy? She can't, she's dead. You said Mummy was there. What do you mean she's dead? It means that she's closing her eyes and she's not breathing. Right, so do you know where you live? Go 22. Can you go to your mummy and shake her for me? She's, she's not waking up. Give her a good shake. Shout out, mummy. Mummy! It didn't work. Are you in Kenley? Yes. What is your name? Roman. This young boy, four years old, used the fingertip of his unconscious mother to unlock the smartphone and then he used Siri to call the EMS. Four years old. So this is Kids Save Lives. What else? Um, where is this? Can you please help me? What do you think? Anesthesiologists in this country started with educating school children. Where is that? Very proud school children from favelas. Our suggestion for kids start at the at four years with check and call, twelve years check call compress and fourteen to sixteen years ventilation and AED. It only takes two hands to save a life. It only takes two hands to save a life. And finally we have a message from the ISS. We are training these guys in EMS. This is Italy, Sicilia. And we have help from our Chancellor. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, that's uh, really cool stuff. Any questions? I'd just like to say that Brexit doesn't save lives, but, um, you know, what can I say? <laughs> um, any questions from anybody? So, as far as you, the politics behind this, I mean, I, 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 so one of the hospitals I work in is St. Thomas's, and it has a 24-hour cath lab that's never been threatened with closure. Um, and in a completely unrelated fact, it's opposite the Houses of Parliament. Um, so there seems to be no political will to close that department down. But to get the politicians to do this seems a bit harder. H how did you do that? It was, it was really hard, but we have, uh, have had a lot of support all over Europe and the world, and it took us 10 years to come from, from where we started to where we are now. So it was really hard, and, um, but you always have to have enough energy and in, in enough um, connections to the politics, and then at the end you are probably and hopefully successful and everyone in the room is invited to help us and everyone in the room is invited to participate in World Restart a Heart 2020 this year, October 16, one week before we release the new guidelines. So if you are not so happy working in the healthcare system because of any problems or so, just go to the next school together with your whole team and train school children. That is a high level of motivation that you can receive from this work. Fantastic. Any questions for anybody? Or sure. Oh, yes, one from Tom. <laughs> right down at the end. <laughs> you need the exercise. Uh, I was wondering, uh, when you teach the children, how young an age do you start at? When can you start teaching? The recommendation for school children education in CPR is 10 to 12 years, which is class 7 probably, because then they have enough physical power to do chest compressions. So check call compress is, fo is for 10 to 12 year old people. If you start earlier, you can do this. You always have some that are not able to do it because they don't have the physical power. And then you got a little bit um, a bad motivation and group dynamics. And with check and call, so check for signs of life and call the EMS, 
we suggest to start in the kindergarten. As you have seen, you can do it with four years already in a very professional way. I mean, I know so many adults that did it in a way that four-year-old um, young Roman did. Yeah, I mean, that, that young kid is, is deeply impressive. Yes. Hi, my name is Michael Stanley. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your work that you do. And um, I think this is the most important bit as a paramedic. I always used to find it very frustrating to uh, come to patients who've been lying on the ground for 10 minutes and knowing that they have a bad chance, regardless of what comes next. Um, I have a question about a uh, Facebook post uh, written uh, one and a half years ago um, on the German Resuscitation Council site, um, which uh, commented on the Paramedic 2 trial and um, there were some points in there which I felt needed clarifying and I wrote an open letter to the ERC and I just wondered whether that ever arrived. I sent it per mail and I had it posted online but I never got an answer back so I wondered whether that even reached you. I'm, I'm not sure. We, so we, we criticize the Paramedic 2 trial is the trial comparing epinephrine and placebo in the UK, you probably know this. The overall survival rate in this trial following out of hospital cardiac arrest, do you remember the numbers? I remember them very well. Comparing epinephrine and placebo, overall survival in UK, 2.8 versus 3.2%. A very, very bad survival rate. It was a significant increase with epinephrine as compared to placebo. But the overall sur survival rates were very low. And uh, do, do you remember, you probably have seen um, in the appendix that was not published of the Paramedic 2 trial, how many patients in that trial received intraosseous access because it was not possible to put an IV line in? Can I just, just add uh, that from the um, excluded from the trial were about 615 patients because they had ROSC before adrenaline was even given, so they weren't followed up in the trial. But of course, if you're comparing overall ROSC rates, then you would have to factor them back in. But we don't have these data. We have asked several times that the investigators provide the data, but we have not received the data. So no one knows the exact survival rate, but we probably can agree that it was not very high. And my question was, do you remember, do you know how many patients received intraosseous access in that trial and no IV access? And we have some signals that intraosseous access is not so good as IV access. It was 40% of the patients receiving intraosseous success. And why was that? Because it was not possible to establish an IV access early. And what we criticized was the fact that um, medication was getting into the patient very late, so the interval between call and administration of study drug, epinephrine, was how long? It was more than 21 minutes. And I would like to make a point that if you have a cardiac arrest, and the first time you put epinephrine in is more uh, after more than 21 minutes, that is too late. It does not make any difference anymore. In the Troika trial, where I was responsible for thrombolysis on cardiac in cardiac arrest some years ago, we administered epinephrine after 12 minutes. And this was a physician-staffed EMS system. So I recommend to have a good education in IV access because that will help to save lives um, in addition to any other measures that we are doing with lay resuscitation and something like this. I mean, I mean uh, just my, my 10 cents worth, I think it's, it's irrelevant who gets there, but it's the getting somebody there that's the problem. And the problem that we have in the UK is with some of our services that the, the time to get an ambulance there is, is far too long. And that, that's, it, that's what's I, causing I, the it problem. It was not the time until the ambulance was there. The time until the ambulance was there was seven minutes in mean after the collapse. But the drug was in both groups after more than 21 minutes and that is far too late and it's not a good system that you have in UK. You need to improve your system. That, <laughs> that, I, I, that, I, I, that is, <laughs> so, so I, as compared to other countries, with, with, with my you other are really late. Yeah. I, think, I think with my other hat on, um, we have 
had no movement in the cardiac arrest survival rate. So in London, where, where I work, we have the advanced paramedic practitioners who are in incredibly well-targeted, an incredibly well-skilled uh, group of clinicians. And they have moved the survival rate slightly, but we're talking tenths of a percent. And actually, I think where the real benefits lie in the system, the real gains lie in the system, are things like the bystander CPR, are things like getting the early interventions there. But certainly, I, I admit, we, there's always room for improvement in our system. Um, and then, you know, with a, uh, the targeted use of eCPR in, in, in a small group of patients. Sorry, uh, Dr. Hubner, did you have something you wanted to ask? Or? The, the last question, because we do need coffee. And I was just interested because there was that subgroup analysis. I'm sure you've read it on Paramedic 2 a couple of weeks ago where they looked at those patients that received adrenaline early and those patients only. And interestingly, the results didn't change. In that trial, yes. It, I mean, I, I still would la make the point that this was not an optimal trial. We have lots of data out in the international literature that it makes a difference whether you administer epinephrine early or late. There is no doubt about that. And it is, for me, there is no doubt that if you are treating a patient, you should get an IV light in as early as possible. That is a signal of quality of the EMS system. And if you have it only after 21 minutes, that's just too late. There is an investigation going on and a meta-analysis whether intraosseous access is um, worse than intravenous access and the results are pending. But there are signals that it is better to get an IOE line in as compared to get an IO line in. But the most important thing is you need to get the line in at, as a, in a very short period of time and not after 21 minutes and more. And we probably all agree that educating school children and educating lay people is the most important access to tripling in survival, isn't um, it? I, I don't think this statement is controversial, but I think coffee, early access to coffee is essential. Um, and, and, and kids can save, save lives by making coffee. <laughs>